Thank you very much. I'm not going to. Sp I, I'm not even going to take your 20 minutes because I can see there's a, a good crowd. I hear in turning people away. How flattering! Um, which means there should be plenty of input from the audience. It wasn't like that. Somebody was asked to speak on leadership at, at Cambridge the day before yesterday when I was there at my old college. And he made such a boring speech that actually he got one question at the end and that was the end of it. So <laughs> I'll try to avoid that. Don't set yourself up to fail. <laughs> I like uh, living dangerously. <laughs> um, if I didn't, I don't think I would have become vice president. Let me just tell you briefly what happened in Zambia six, seven months ago. We um, were expected, widely expected, to fail, to displace the MMD government, which had been going with uh, my support, I'm proud to say, since 1991. But I left it in 1993 and was in opposition or out of politics for a while. And then Michael Sutter came along in 2001, having been refused the successorship to Frederick Chaluba with his own party, as did many other leaders of the MMD, several other leaders of the MMD. Um, and he called me up and said, come on, let's, let's have a crack at the taking over the government of Zambia. I suppose I was flattered or anyway interested, so I, we, we, we set off. We got 6%, I think, of the vote in that election. One member of parliament out of 150 elected members of parliament. Uh, he went into jail. I went into hospital with for a triple bypass. And it took us a few months to recoup, regroup. And we started uh, a campaign which really didn't stop for another eight years, or eight and a half years. Um, and that, that came to a head last year. Well, 2006, we got 43 odd seats out of the 150, which was better than any, any other opposition party, um, but not enough to, to cause them serious trouble. And uh, then last year, oh sorry, then in 2008, there was a presidential by-election following the death of President Wanawasa, who was the third president of Zambia. Uh, and that put Michael Sato against our Michael Sato effectively head to head with Rupia Banda. And there were some other candidates, but uh, it didn't really count. We lost by two percentage points. So we were going up in a straight line, more or less, linear. A simple model would explain it. And eventually, last year, we got to the 2011 election, uh, which we won by handsomely. In both in, t in terms of seats, we were a bit skint. We only had a couple more than MMD, but we've made up for that since by A, paying off MMD guys to come and work for us, and B, uh, taking winning by-elections, which have arisen uh, and are continuing to arise as time goes on. Michael Sato got a clean, what, 46% against 50 odd, uh, sorry, 46% against 41, no, 38, 44, something like that, which was easily enough, a comfortable, comfortable margin. Um, I was appointed the vice president. I was already vice president of the party, and people expected me to be <coughs> vice president, and I don't think it was that much of a surprise, except, you know, you always think these things are really not going to happen. I think surely it's going to be another five years on the back benches or something. But uh, it, it happened. And it, it's interesting to try and figure out why it happened, I think, for a lot of them, because Zambia at this time, during, during the whole of the 2000s and noughties, up to 2011, was getting kudos from everybody, saying how well the economy was doing, GDP growth was such and such, the fundamentals are right, the, 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 you know, patience is all that's needed, look, inflation's low, look, and so forth. And, uh, but what was happening was that we were experiencing growth that didn't involve any job, incre any increase in the number of jobs. We were experiencing jobless growth, essentially. 
and the economy or the, the schooling system, whatever, the education system was pouring 300,000 people a year roughly into the labor market and none of them were being taken up. But they were obtaining voters' cards. So the voters' cards were much easier to get hold of than the jobs. So eventually you had a majority, <coughs> your, your uh, electorate was majority unemployed. And our pitch was directly to them, more jobs, more money in your pocket, lower, lower taxes. There are people here who can say it in Bemba. What more can I say? Um, and that, that, that message resonated, and nothing would, nothing would uh, get rid of it, really. I mean, there was a lot of money spent by the, by the MMD, by the Movement of Multiparty Democracy, uh, in its attempt to stay in power. They were very confident they were going to make it. There were people who collected tw 20 chitengi cloths, 17 flags, several, several bicycles, and were still voting for us because they, we had managed to disconnect the idea of reward from, the immediate reward from the idea of voting anyway. So, of and, and uh, this is not, I'm sure, a unique story. What is unique is that it all ha happened peacefully. Nobody disputed and said, no, the, the, the elections are wrong. There may have been attempts, but we don't know about them if there were. Um, the Chief Justice duly swore in Michael Sata, and the police and the army and everybody else behaved themselves, and the new opposition took its seats in Parliament, and things proceeded perfectly normally. That's, if you take that in a, as one in a succession of elections, that followed upon Côte d'Ivoire, that followed upon Zimbabwe, that followed upon Kenya. It's the political success story of the election. Was it? Never mind if you want to dispute the stories about w whether you could have created jobs or not. The fact is, it was a, it was a, the second landslide or uh, uh, upheaval in Zambian electoral politics. The first one being 1991 when. Multi-party democracy came back, and Kenneth Kaunda was wiped off the face of the map, and uh, the second one being last year, 2011. There are questions, political questions, about what now happens to the MMD, because what happened to UNIT after 1991 is that it shriveled and shriveled and shriveled, and now is virtually non-existent. It's not the British model where you, you uh, expect to go into the wilderness, <coughs> throw, throw out your leaders, find some new leaders, throw them out. I mean, you've got to look at the history of the Conservative Party recently to see what the British process is, and compared to the Zambian process, where the, 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 all that's happened is that the former ruling party that ruled for 27 years has, to all intents and purposes, ceased to exist. It's not a factor anymore. And I guess the interesting political question now is what happens to MMD? Is it going to shrivel and die? Or is it going to find new leadership, as it says it's going to do? And um, <coughs> that's an that's a interesting question. Or do you get another, another new party, quotes coming along and taking over? And that, you know, people say, and I think it's significant, that it's, uh, 10 years, you had to wait for 10 years, you fought for 10 years and you got power. This is another... I'm obsessed by the... Or I'm interested in the difference in people's time horizons in Africa and elsewhere. And people seem to think 10 years is an awfully long time in Africa. Because I think they think Africa is unstable and, and nothing can last for 10 years without changing radically. And someone gave me the example of the Centre Party in Norway, which was formed in about 1885 fought every election until it got its first member of parliament in 1927 <laughs> and was then in parliament ever, was then in government ever since in the coalition government in Norway except maybe recently, I don't know. But um, people, people are amazed, they think you, you fought for 10 years in one party, one message, one, one campaign without money and all this kind of stuff, eh, so what, 10 years is actually very reasonable amount of time to invest in taking over a government. Uh, would that so many other people were as lucky. I think one of the reasons I'm here, or in Britain at the moment, is to try and get communications going. I mean, people, a lot of people, I mean, not, not 
present company, of course, but there are people who who've, who've come to Zambia and said how welcome, how happy they are to be in Gambia. British <laughs> government, <laughs> British government ministers, no less. Arthur Bottomley said that. And Private I, when he died, eventually said he's gone to Devon. <laughs> um, and it doesn't help not to be known about because you end up being known about only through the Fitch ratings or something like that and the Fitch ratings can be anything they're, 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 they're themselves not something very stable or reliable uh, as we know from the uh, uh, subprime mortgage based uh, ratings but and you know you you tend to be get misunderstood easily because newspapers send junior journalists to learn the, the art of journalism in places like Zambia because it doesn't really matter if they get it wrong and so you need the odd vice president wandering around trying to get things uh, more or less straight we are interested at the moment uh, we've got a strong anti-corruption uh, program or campaign on the go. We've been in power about 200 days, roughly, seven months. Uh, we've uh, done several things that we said we would do, one of which is to take back the, the, the state telephone company, which was sold to Mama Gaddafi via the Cayman Islands, which uh, towards the end of towards the end of the election campaign. And I mean, it's a rather silly thing to try and do. Um, and there have been se several commissions of inquiry and several more going on into various uh, scams by the previous government. We are beset by problems of high interest rates, which I think, again, is a reflection of, is a reflection of, 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 of people's short time horizon in Zambia. A bank comes to Zambia to lend money. They expect to get their double their money in three years. They charge 25% real interest. And you can't compete with anybody like that. You can't compete on the export markets. And you can't compete if, for example, you're a Zambian contractor. How do you compete with a Chinese contract construction company that's borrowing at 6% or 8% from the Export Import Bank of China? Interest rates are forming a very central part of our battle at the moment. We're being told, oh, no, this is a special country. You get poor, poor compliance. Uh, you get this and that. But actually, it's just that people think that if they invest in our part of the world, they have to get their money back quickly. And that uh, kills a lot of foreign investment, and it kills a lot of domestic investment via the, the banking, banking system. It pu pushes house prices up, it pushes house rents up. So again, people, if they build a house, you want to get your money back in three years or four years as opposed to 10 or 15 or years or whatever would be normal in a developed country. So these are structural problems. And it actually r cuts across the whole thing. I think in Africa generally, and certainly in Zambia, you come across some hulking great big game hunter who's a Russian oligarch in his day job or he's a American dentist or cosmetic dentist or something. He's somebody with more money than he ought to have. And he's got a 475 with a half meter long uh, telescopic sight on it and he's got a couple of handguns and about six people protecting him. And you find out if you talk to him that he's dead scared. He's in Africa. He's in, he's in, he's in unknown wild Africa. In fact, our tourism board had to change its motto. It, it used to be Zambia, the real Africa. And they've quickly discovered nobody wanted to be in the real Africa. <laughs> <laughs> they all wanted to go to Johannesburg and, and, and shoot circus animals, you know, sort of sitting at the end of tar roads. Um, and, and I think there is, that, you know, there is a serious issue of, of, of being considered a dangerous place, a short-term place place where you, where you can't spend money on a good long-term basis. And I think that's what I've come to try and help dispel. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to succeed a million percent or possibly even two percent. But I mean, I've come round and spoken to them all at Canary Wharf. A great lack of irony at Canary <laughs> Wharf. And you, you should be careful. I, I, I said, oh, gosh, yesterday I'm, I'm really discombobulated. Yesterday I was in a country that believed in witchcraft. And now I'm at Canary Wharf. And they didn't laugh. 
they were sort of thinking to themselves, is he being ironical or something? <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I've been, I've been talking to the bankers at uh, Canary Wharf. I've been uh, talking to a business school in Cambridge, went to my old college. I see Alistair's here, having witnessed my heroic return, in fact, considering how did ignominiously I was eventually pushed out of Cambridge. And um, now today we have been, um, we have been uh, talking to one or two people, uh, talking to the BBC, the, the, the hard talk, Stephen Saka, mm -hmm. Africa, um, what's it called, Africa? Focus on Africa. Focus on Africa, yes. Quite, quite, quite good questioning. And now I'm here. And I'm very, I'm, I'm as anxious to hear your views, I'm as anxious to hear your suggestions, your, your worries and concerns. I mean, we need to create, we've, we've probably got, it's very difficult to estimate what the employment rate is. Um, but we do know, and again, I've got witnesses here who will <coughs> confirm what I say, is that if you go in the working day, in working hours, to a town like Solwezi, which is supposedly the center of mining growth in Zambia, you can whistle up a rally in the middle of the rain. You can whistle up a massive rally of thousands of young people uh, to listen to your message. And uh, that was happening during the campaign. The MMD couldn't get people even when the sun was shining and it wasn't a working day. But there are tens and hundreds of thousands of people out there who have no job, nor hope for a job, nor any social security, nor anything that, 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 that really provides them with a livelihood. And that is the major problem. And that's why we need to, and mining is terrible at solving that problem, because if you look at some of the mining f statistics, it can cost $200,000 or even $400,000 to create a single job. Employed job, okay, there'll be some trickle down, some second hand stuff. Whereas in agriculture it's less than $10,000, in tourism it's supposedly less than $5,000. So presumably we have to shift our growth uh, across into these non so called non traditional sectors, although they're just as traditional as mining is, and uh, get people gainfully employed. Yes, I, I'd be very interested to see how the Spanish handle the same problem. I mean, they've got 25% unemployment. We've got at least that and conceivably twice as much or even three times as much as that, depending on your definition of what's a usefully employed person. And we know Britain is uh, youth is not doing well at the moment. I mean, this is, is, this is part of a worldwide phenomenon. But uh, any advice will be very welcome. So please, don't feel inhibited uh, needing to ask a clever question. Just, give, I mean, think, give us what you think, give us what you thought, because you're going to have to deal with this problem again and again <coughs> here in ODI. It's, just, it's not a Zambian problem. This is just a sample of an African problem, and that, that in its turn, our samples of European problems now afflicting the, Carib the Mediterranean area and, 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 and certain demographic groups in Britain itself. The United States, of course, has, has been one long struggle to try and stop the joblessness growing above 10% <coughs> and so forth. So <coughs> we, uh, as I said, in, in Cambridge, we need a new Keynesian. We need somebody to do what Keynes did. And Keynes did it with much less of a problem, <laughs> in, a, in a sense. But we need to understand employment, and we need to understand how you create it, because these fundamentals that they talk about, isn't, isn't unemployment a fundamental? I mean, they say, you know, they, people talk as if, or some economists of the Washington Consensus Variety, or the Chicago Variety, tend to talk as if it was inflation and, and balanced payments and so forth that was the fundamentals. But I mean, employment is surely the fundamental. It's the reason we go to work and have an economy at all, is so that we can make a living. So I think with those few words, I shall now Good. desist. Thank and you. Listen. Just just before you stop. Yes. Um, I'm really curious. You were you were famously a wonderful minister of agriculture at the time of the, the drought. I think in you early see, 1990. Paid him. Oh. Uh, I'm just curious to know your reflections on 
what is like being a, 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 a vice president and running a government in the modern age? No, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's what you make of it and what other people make of it as well, especially the one who appoints you. Um, you obviously are the, the most well-placed person to coordinate multidisciplinary or multi-ministry, multi-sectoral multi issues. I mean, AIDS tends to come and center around me because the Ministry of Health and the NGOs and the Ministry of, of, of Women and Child and so forth tends to kind of want to come together. And um, so I sort of end up coordinating a few things. But you know, people's egos are fragile. You have to be very careful with it, even with that fairly obvious activity. There are standard dangers, which I think are standard for vices, vice anything, is that you, you can easily step on the big boss's toes by saying something which you think you're going to be congratulated for saying and it turns out you shouldn't have said it in the first place. Uh, or your, and, and also, likewise, your, your fellow ministers <coughs> feel that you know, they've been working on something and you're taking it away. At the same time, if you do nothing, you get hammered very, very hard for doing nothing. So it, 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 it's, it's walking a, walking a tight, tight path. And uh, as I think you pointed out, Yes, there's also, you know, if somebody wants to di divert the shot, di divert the incoming shells, then you're a, u you're a useful firewall. You just stand there and take it like a man and, and think, well, maybe I'll resign, maybe I won't. But it's a rough job. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it uh, requires a bit of optimism and a, and a bit of amnesia, I think. <laughs> right, thanks.